Welcome participants to the advanced training. My name is Lynn Wild, K-State Research and Extension, Wyandotte County Master Gardener, and I serve as Vice President and Program Chair. Our topic today is transformation of a super fun site to a pollinator habitat, uh, presented by Sammy Ahrens. Now I'd like to introduce Sammy Ahrens. She is a extension, her extension ma master naturalist training has broadened her understanding of the interconnectivity between nature and humanity with an eye towards restoration and protection of natural areas and the wildlife that they inhabit, that inhabit them. She is the author of The Evolution of a Gardener in the April 2018 Kansas City Gardener Magazine, where she shares her shift into a garden, gardening ethic that nurtures the intrinsic relationship between humanity and the natural world. Uh, Sammy is a yoga and meditation teacher and founder and executive director of the Resilient Activists, whose mission is to build resilience, optimism, and hope in response to the impact of the climate crisis. And the presentation today, in it we will hear the inspiring and unique story of the pollinator prairie situated in an older neighborhood in Olathe and how it was transformed from a toxic uh, super fun site to an ecological habit. So without further ado, I'll let Sammy take over. Thanks so much, Lynn. I want to thank you for the invitation, first of all, because this is a delight to be able to share this with, um, with others in the Kansas City area who might actually have the opportunity to go out to the pollinator prairie and check it out. So um, I'm really grateful to be here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So um, I think Lynn did a really thorough um, introduction. So I'm just going to kind of skip through here. Um, one of the things that I, I want to mention, um, in addition, just introducing myself, um, I'm an environmental activist volunteering mostly with a number of environmental groups. And typically, my focus is on land use and restoration of pollinator habitat. I've been doing that for about, oh my goodness, over 20 years. It's just been something that's just called to me. Um, so I just want to kind of add that piece to my introduction. Um, I'm a nature-connected educator. I use a process called the nature process, which is just a way to help people take whatever's on their mind and their hearts and their bodies out to nature and find that sense of welcoming and release and uh, all the healing benefits of time spent in nature. So that's a big part of what I, uh, what I offer. Um, I am certified with the Climate Reality Leadership Training. That's Al Gore's program on global um, climate change and climate justice. It's been a very interesting program to go through. And as Lynn mentioned, the founder of the Resilient Activist. So Today I'm wearing the hat of an Extension Master Naturalist, um, and I will talk about that a little bit more today. I want to acknowledge that this Zoom meeting hosted in Kansas City is held on the traditional lands of the Osage, the Kaw, the Kansa, the Kickapoo, and the Sioux people. The pollinator prairie itself is located on the land of the Kickapoo. We have much to learn from our indigenous elders about ways to live in harmony with the natural world. I do want to mention that uh, any links that you see or resources that I mentioned during this presentation will all be in, there's a, a page up on uh, the Resilient Activist website. The link to that is on the very last slide. So you'll have access. You don't have to try and write down every single resource and link that I mentioned today. Um, one thing I wanted to add to uh, the introduction of the Resilient Activist we are a nonprofit and we are a coordinating partner with the Kansas City Conservation Equity Network to expand justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion in land use organizations 
and to pr promote racial equity in the environment. So um, these are just some of our programs. I'm not gonna spend any time on that today. I'll just go back the slide. But if you're interested, we focus especially on supporting the mental health, emotional well-being of those who are active in the environmental and social justice movements. So check us out, theresilientactivist.org. Um, today we're talking about the pollinator prairie and um, it's a very interesting, heartwarming story, at least to me, is the sense that uh, humans have offered these kinds of things. This is what the site looked like when it was first shut down, uh, this black and white picture here, shut down in 1989. And this is what it looked like um, the first year after the planting. So there's always opportunity to replenish, to restore and nurture, and it just feels really good. The site is located um, not too far from the I-35 exit uh, off of Santa Fe, which is 135th Street. It's just about a mile, not probably not even two miles from that exit. So right in a little neighborhood there. Today's presentation, we'll be talking about an historical perspective on the site's history as a chemical waste site, You'll have an understanding of how the pollinator gardens were developed, the important impact of the site to pollinators, people, and the environment, and how you can create your own no-dig native garden at home in 10 easy steps. And for, um, for this community today, I'm spending a little extra time on what the Extension Master Naturalists do so that you have a better understanding of that because it is a relatively new program. Uh, there's more information about the site on the original Pollinator Partnership web website. This image is Dr. Orly Chip Taylor. Some of you may know him. Professor Emeritus, Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Kansas. And he, he's the founder of Monarch Watch. Chip and others helped to determine the list of plants that would be the most, um, the most value for native pollinators and especially monarch butterflies at the pollinator prairie site. There is a video um, at, at this site that gives even more detail about the actual cleanup and who was involved and um, interviews EPA people. It's a very interesting video. So I'm not gonna play it today, but, but um, I invite you to follow the link. There's another video uh, that, that's on the uh, handout link that's a garden tour. This was uh, in 2020 when we couldn't have our uh, Pollinator Week event at the Pollinator Prairie. This is usually held in June because of coronavirus. And um, I just went out there with my phone and just took a, did a walking video. So it's the least professional video you'll ever see, but man, the gardens were gorgeous that day. So you'll have the link to that also. Let's talk about some of the details here, the history of the site. This site was a former chemical recycling facility. It was owned by a company, Chemical Commodities Inc., or CCI, from the 1950s until it was shut down in 1989. CCI was an authorized site for manufacturing companies to send their chemical waste to be recycled or repurposed. So this was all before the Environmental Protection Agency was formed in 1970. But instead of doing what they were supposed to do, CCI put privacy fencing up around the property. They left barrels out to be exposed to the weather and allowed chemicals to seep into the ground in leaky underground storage tanks. So some of the steps that were taken for the remediation were air quality vapor mitigation devices, were installed in about 40 homes. So they're similar to the radon equipment that you see. Um, a few homes did show elevated levels of various chemicals. And you'll see in some of the later pictures how close the houses were to this site. Homeowners in the vicinity were given the option to have a device installed even if there were no chemical concentrations detected. So, so what happens with that is Rain seeps into the groundwater and it takes along with it any chemicals that it picks up from the soil. That water then flows to lower levels through the neighborhood to the west of the property in this site, in this particular location. The site is in the Mill Creek watershed, which empties into the Kansas River, which empties into the Missouri River, onto the Mississippi River, and then on down to the Gulf of Mexico. So by cleaning up this site, it's eliminating those chemicals 
through all of our rivers and streamways. As the groundwater evaporates and flows through the neighborhood, any chemicals, so heavy metals and VOCs or volatile organic compounds that are in the groundwater are released through evaporation. And that's what impacts the air quality in the homes that were in that vicinity. So some of these images are, this is the aerial view before the restoration began. And um, this is some equipment removing the soil. This is the installation of the soil cap. And I'll talk about that more in more detail. So 15 to 20 foot trenches were dug on about an acre of the property and the soil was removed over portions of the property. In some places they took out up to eight feet of soil on about this acre and took it to places unknown. We haven't yet learned where that was taken to, but it would be a site that stores uh, toxic materials. It was replaced with fresh soil and topped with a soil cap. The soil cap itself is about a three foot deep area. So it's layered with 12 inches of gravel, a layer of this really thick geotextile fabric, 12 inches of compacted soil, and then 12 inches of topsoil. So we can plant wildflowers and shrubs on top of the soil cap because those roots can either turn sideways or they can penetrate the cap without damage. But we can't ever plant any trees on this site because the deeper, larger horizontal roots would damage the cap. So the cap has four main purposes. First, to provide a barrier above potentially impacted soils that were left in place at the site. Two, to re reduce surface water infiltration. Three, to maximize the beneficial reuse of the site. In other words, to be able to turn it back into open green space for the public. And four, to minimize potential exposure to chemical emissions from impacted soil below the cap. So the geotextile fabric, it's a strong synthetic fabric usually used in civil engineering construction like highway or dam building, and it stabilizes loose soil and prevents erosion. So there are some newer versions of this that would allow planting of trees, but they didn't come out until after the site was remediated. Anyway, it's a very interesting process. So it's a formal chemical recycling facility in the EPA Region 7, designated a Superfund site. I'll talk about that in a minute. The property, the company was shut down in 1989. Um, and the goals really were to eliminate the exposure, do the remediation, develop some positive community relations, because once the community learned what was really happening there, of course, there were a lot of concern about health and, uh, and well-being, and then put the, be able to put the land back as a neighborhood green space. So there were a lot of partners involved in this. It wasn't a simple project. Um, besides the EPA, Region 7, there was Rocket Dyne. Rocket Dyne was an aerospace business. Uh, they make avionics equipment that shipped some of their waste chemicals to CCI. They were briefly owned by the Boeing company. Boeing took the lead and still works with the EPA on behalf of the responsible parties to clean up and maintain the safety of the site. Haley and Aldrich is an environmental consulting firm in Overland Park. They were hired by Boeing to manage the restoration and the long-term maintenance, and they've been involved since the beginning, since the site was first shut down. And then there were volunteers, lots of volunteers, and other partners, including Monarch Watch, the Pollinator Partnership, and the Wildlife Habitat Council. So Chemical Commodities is a defunct company, yet it still shows as the uh, owner on the Johnson County property tax rolls because there's nobody that owns this site. So let me give you a little overview here. Um, this is the BNSF Railroad down the right side at the angle. The railroad runs right alongside there. This little circular drive is Blake Street. The address is 320 South Blake. And that heads out, if we head on north there, we'd hit uh, Santa Fe 135th Street. Um, this is Cedar Street and this is Keeler Street right here. So the property is from this, it's just this triangle right here between Keeler and the railroads, okay? So um, Keeler Street opens space, owns the property where homes were removed 
along Keeler and Cedar Street. So you can see there are still existing homes here. There were homes on this side of the property on the same, in the same block as Chemical Commodities was. Um, BNSF Railroad owns some of the property on the east side. There is a wrought iron fence that goes from, uh, from this opening here all the way down to where those first trees are on the property. There's no fence down here amongst these trees and BNSF owns some of that property. Um, and it's still zoned as R1 single family, although the use designation is recreation. So it will never be built on, it will never be used for uh, single family homes. So let's talk a little bit about um, what a Superfund site is. Congress established the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, also known as CERCLA, C-E-R-C-L-A. They established that in 1980. So CERCLA is informally called Superfund. It allows the EPA to clean up contaminated sites. It also forces the parties responsible for the contamination to either perform cleanups or reimburse the government for EPA-led cleanup work. When there's no viable responsible party, Superfund gives the EPA the funds and authority to clean up the contaminated sites. So let's talk about rocket dyeing. Certain wastes that are regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency must follow a chain of custody protocol for disposal. So this means the company that originally produced the waste maintains responsibility for its proper disposal throughout the lifetime of the waste. So even if a company disposes of it properly, they remain liable for any future improper handling of the materials as happened in this instance at the Pollinator Prairie. There was a Citizens Advisory Committee. It's, it's no longer in, in place, but there was a pretty large group of uh, residents who lived around the property who were involved in um, the restoration of the site. So a couple more details. Uh, neighborhood Assessment Coordinator through Olathe Planning Department uh, was involved. Olathe Park and Rec has been involved. They've actually been helpful to us even with some invasive species removal and things like that. So the EPA and all the responsible parties are going to be involved for decades. And the words that I've heard is in perpetuity. So this is not just a you know, done and done deal. This is gonna be ongoing, continued monitoring in perpetuity. So here's what the site looked like kind of going through the processes here. Um, in April, 2021, this was before any cleanup began. You can see there's still some homes on the property here. Some of the buildings had already been removed, but Chemical Commodities was right. They had their facility in this part of the site. In June of 2011, the site cleanup was in progress. You can see the houses are gone and they've, they're kind of designating some areas, specific areas here. In August of 2011, the monitoring systems were in place. The soil had been removed and replaced and the soil cap was installed. So you can see that the location of the soil cap here. So again, here's the little circle drive uh, at the end of Blake Street and the soil cap is on part of this. So this area at the north, uh, there were still some trees remaining and at the south end also. In early 2012 then, this is what the restored site looked like. You can see there was a sidewalk installed here with a little round platform. These gardens, there's four, um, they'll show up better in later pictures. Um, four of the native pollinator gardens were uh, created. They weren't planted yet. And we had five, these rectangular lines here are the grassy sites. So there were four gardens and five grass, native grasses that didn't have any forbs in them. So this is what it kind of looked like in the beginning. It was just mowed grass, right? And that was kind of it. So that was in September of 2012. So the site timeline, chemical commodities, 1951 to 89, the cleanup and remediation then that was shut down in 89. It took until 2011 before they actually completed the remediation. 2012, they returned it to the community of Olathe and the Pollinator Prairie Gardens were installed in 2012. 
From 2012 to 2017, the gardens were managed by volunteers and some of them were master gardeners, some were just neighbors, some were people who had been involved um, that just kind of liked coming out there. Uh, a couple of the people working at Haley and Aldridge just like to come out and work at the, uh, at the pollinator prairie doing garden maintenance. There was ongoing monitoring from Haley and Aldridge representing the EPA, right, monitoring the site. In 2017, then, the gardens became uh, ma uh, managed and an official project of the uh, K-State Johnson County Master Naturalists. So I was the first chair of that first committee uh, to try and figure out what we were going to do with this site. Nobody knew anything about it. Uh, we didn't even know it was there. It was a really fun time. So anyway, so that's kind of, and we're monitoring that to the present time. So here's the entryway. I choke up. This just sign says, return to the community of Olathe in 2012. Forgive me, I get real emotional. Okay. I mentioned the original website, the one that had the video with uh, Chip Taylor. On that same site, there is a list of all the plants, the planting lists for each of the gardens. And so within those gardens, there's a bee garden, butterfly garden, monarch garden, and a bird garden. So the monarch garden focuses, as you would expect, on a number of different varieties of milkweed, whereas a butterfly garden focuses on host plants for other butterflies and moths. The bee garden focuses on uh, the type of plants that our native bees require. And then the bird garden um, is focused on just um, the one pollinator that we have, which is our, our hummingbird. So anyway, it's a great site. And when you click on these plant lists on that site, you get a screen similar to this. So this is in the bee garden and each plant that they, that they show on the list, these are what were planted originally in the gardens. Okay, that some of that has changed over these years. Um, but this plant down at the bottom here, the Baptisia alba, it's the host plant for this critter, the wild indigo dusky wing butterfly. So host plants uh, for this butterfly are the false indigo, any variety of the, of the false indigo, crown vetch and cow vetch, which are both non-native. So the caterpill caterpillars of these butterflies can only eat the leaves of those specific plants. So if a native garden doesn't have false indigo or any of the indigos, then there will be none of these butterflies there because they, the female has nothing to lay her eggs on. So the roots of some of these native plants can be up to 15 feet deep. Um, to give you a sense of the size of the gardens, each of the four leaf-shaped garden beds measures 30 by 60 feet, and the grass strips are 90 by 15 feet. So they're a pretty big area to manage. So I mentioned um, our, our pollinators. Uh, that are not insects. We're all familiar with pollinators such as bees, butterflies, moths, dragonflies, flies, and beetles, but we don't often think of bats and hummingbirds. So the only hummingbird in Kansas is the ruby-throated hummingbird. Um, the long-eared bat is in Kansas, and we're providing habitat for other pollinators too, not just insects. So at this site, there are um, a number of kiosks. If you went out there today, uh, they're all completely burnt out by the sun, but new ones are on order and should be in hopefully within the next couple weeks. But they're great kiosks. Each, each of the gardens has its own kiosk with information about what's there, important points to look at, and the QR code that would take you to the site that has the plant list and other information about it. Each of the plants originally had their own uh, tags, right? We had stakes in the ground marking each of the plants. Uh, some of you, your gardeners, you probably know that plants choose to meander through the garden. So uh, they got to be kind of difficult trying to keep the signs in the right place with the right plants. But uh, that's just kind of one of the interesting things that we learned. So this is over 60 volunteers on the first planting day. So this was the day the plants were going to be installed. Um, this is the aerial image that you saw earlier. Each of these four gardens look like leaves here is what we're, they're planting in, and then the grassy beds here. And this is what they looked like before they really 
the plants started to grow. Um, we did use red mulch in the garden bed. So we're inviting people to step into, off the sidewalk and step into each of these beds so that they can walk around amongst the plants. Um, we wouldn't normally recommend red mulch. Uh, we prefer something more natural and, and not even wood mulch. But in this case, it was a very visual cue to encourage people to step in and experience the plants close up. Okay, this is the prairie grasses and wildflowers kiosk that's by one of those areas. And believe it or not, there were like, I don't remember how many, I wanna say 1500 plants or something. And they got them all planted in less than an hour. It was like crazy. I wish I'd been there. This is some of the other pictures now that they're installed. This is the first year of these plants. And just so you can see, there's a lot of cardinal flower in this garden. There is no cardinal flower in there anymore. It, it wasn't happy there other than after the first year. So that's just the way that that goes. But I want you to notice that this property is certified through the Wildlife Habitat Council's Corporate Lands for Learning certification. I want to talk about some of the other certifications. The, the property is gold certified within the Wildlife Habitat Council Conservation Certification Program. So gold is the highest level and it's offered through this program, also offer certified and silver levels. The program specifically designated to recognize meaningful wildlife habitat management and conservation education programs on corporate lands. So these programs are in 47 of the United States, 47 states and 28 countries worldwide. There's a lot of different ways to show conservation progress and obtain certification, and you have to reapply every year. Specifically, the pollinator prairie meets the certification standards through maintaining the native landscape habitat, meaning pollinator gardens, focusing on food, shelter, and reproductive needs of the pollinators, and providing educational program and community awareness through the partnership with the Extension Master Naturalists and by hosting two annual community events. And I'll talk about those in a minute. The site is a registered Monarch Way Station under Monarch Watch. So the creation and maintenance of Monarch Way Stations contributes to Monarch conservation and helps to assure the continuation of the Monarch migration in North America. Way Stations must provide milkweeds, nectar plants, and shelter for Monarchs throughout their annual cycle of reproduction and migration. These can be created in home gardens, at schools, businesses, parks, zoos, nature centers, along roadsides, and any other unused plots of land. And it can be as simple as just adding milkweeds and nectar sources to existing gardens or maintaining natural habitats with milkweeds. No efforts too small to have a positive impact. So one of the links you'll have is to monarchwatch.org slash waystations for guidelines and how to register your own site. In 2014, the US Fish and Wildlife Service had been petitioned to protect the monarch butterfly under the Endangered Species Act. Based on information in the petition, they determined that federally protecting the monarch may be warranted. In December of 2020, after an extensive status assessment of the monarch butterfly, it was determined that listing the monarch under the Endangered Species Act is warranted, but precluded at this time by higher priority listing actions. So what that means is, yes, it should be listed as endangered with all the federal protection that comes with that, but no, it's not listed because it's just not high up enough in the list of what's prioritized. The site is a certified wildlife habitat under the National Wildlife Federation's Garden for Wildlife Movement. The requirements for that are food, water, cover, places to raise young and sustainable practices. Private properties, as opposed to corporate properties in the other designation, private properties make up approximately one third of the urban landscape. These properties can connect corridors of habitat necessary for migratory species and to support healthy migratory and resident species. Creating a wildlife garden reverses some of the human caused habitat destruction that's hurting wildlife. And it's easier than you think to create your own wildlife garden. So you can get, you can get any of these signs for your garden. So the site recap, 
Uh, the total area is 3.46 acres. About an acre of it has gardens on it. About uh, two, little over two acres is the actual remediation site. There are the four pollinator garden beds that we mentioned, uh, the five prairie grasses with uh, mixed wildflowers, and there's water access at each bed. There's a, a, an underground uh, faucet that so that we can water. They watered quite a bit the first few years and then anytime we have new plantings. But other than that, we really are using the water for um, uh, butterfly puddlers uh, and a bird bath. So um, there were at that time, as of 2012, there were public benches, a tool shed, the signage was in place and the paved walkway was there. Questions, are there any questions at this point? Is what do you usually recommend as mulch instead of wood mulch? Usually recommend um, shredded leaves, which are last year's leaves that have been allowed to overwinter until late March or April before they're actually shredded to be used for the next year. So there's overwintering insects in those leaves. So for example, I have a picture later of a luna moth that they look like fairies. And they, their eggs, the adult will lay the egg on a leaf, uh, on a living tree, a living leaf, and then that leaf will fall. Uh, the egg will turn into a chrysalis and overwinter in that, the leaf litter and won't emerge until it's in the 50s, 55 degrees, pretty uh, regularly at nighttime. So late March or early April. So that's the best. The other thing you can use, of course, is any, any natural material, grasses, straw, um, it's important not to stack up wood mulch to two or three or four inches, which you see a lot of times. A lot of the native bees are ground nesters and other, other critters also, and they're just not strong enough to push that mulch away to be able to get into the ground. Or if they were in the ground, you know, the eggs were laid down in the ground the season before, when they're ready to emerge, they're not able to emerge out of that heavy, uh, the heaviness of the wood mulch. So the two events that I mentioned, um, we have a Wonders of Discovery Day in June. It's usually the second week, I think, uh, part of the, uh, it's Pollinator Week, National Pollinator Week. Um, and it focuses on all pollinators. That event is attended by Johnson County Summer Camp participants. Buses arrive. We had over 400 kids, uh, mostly elementary age, arrive by bus, bus. Plus, we have hundreds of visitors from the general public. We have booths set up along the sidewalks that are native versus honeybees, chemical free gardening, habitat gardening, making seed balls. Um, and then we have in September, this year it's going to be September 25th, the Hasta Luego Monarchs event. And it's during the September migration. So we are, I-35 is actually uh, the perfect path that a lot of the monarch butterflies migrate up and down I-35. So we're right in that section and um, we focus on butterflies for that event, whereas the Wonders of Discovery will focus on all pollinators. Um, we have the Olathe Public Library comes and does readings and artwork and stories on monarchs. Um, there's a lot of events about uh, butterflies, about the monarch in particular. We um, have had one of my neighbors happen to have grown up in the monarch's winter home uh, in Mexico. And so he's come in the past and spoken on what that was like as a child living in that area. They're free, open to the public. Uh, put them on your calendar. So these are what some of our community events look like. Um, we have 20 or more tents. Some of the presenters are from the EPA, uh, Johnson County Environmental, Monarch Watch brings a caterpillar petting zoo, which is great. Operation Wildlife will bring some of their birds of prey. Uh, the Northeast Kansas beekeepers come. We have just all kinds of aspects of gardening for nature, plus face painting, music, food, dance, artwork, crafts, and games. And we are gonna be able to do this again one day. We know that we will. So we move into January of 2017 when the Extension Master Naturalist stepped in. So the gardens were about five years old at that point. 
um, we had our own first entryway sign. So the pollinator prairie is now an official project of the Master Naturals program. And I would imagine with Master Gardeners that you have specific sites that you can work out where you're, you can gather your volunteer hours that you need to ac accumulate for your certification. This became the first site that the Master Naturalists um, adopted as their own, as their own first official site. So volunteer work hours count towards our annual requirement to maintain our certification. The gardens are designed to help people, just like you, visualize how you could provide habitat like this in your own yard or in a corporate setting. I'm going to go ahead and read this because it's our mission statement for the pollinator prairie. It's to grow and maintain native plant communities at the pollinator prairie to provide habitat for native pollinators and other wildlife and create a living laboratory to educate and inspire the inclusion of native plants into home garden areas. And the key words there are living laboratory. We have learned a lot about what to do, what not to do, what plants to choose, what plants to place in certain areas and um, how to maintain. So you can see in this garden here, you can see that mulch, the red has faded a little bit, but you can see where people can get right in there. Well, some of these plants, especially because they were planted in really nice topsoil, uh, they went crazy the first couple of years. They got so tall, it was, it was much nicer soil than they would have been planted in had they just been out in a prairie area, you know, dry, uh, rocky maybe, Flint Hills type, maybe clay soil. Uh, it would have been really different uh, environment for the plants to be in. But in these with the really good soil, some of these plants got so tall and around the paths here then, either we fenced them up or they would just fall over the path. So it's been a learning experience how to manage a uh, public site as a demonstration garden for, um, for home, home planting. Uh, you know, most of the demonstration gardens are big wildflower meadows or, you know, areas that don't really require the aesthetics that people might want to have in their own homes. So it's been very interesting. So I became an Extension Master Naturalist in 2015. It was just the third year of the organization. It was just started a couple years prior to that. And um, it's Citizen Science Initiative of K-State Johnson County Extension. We provide natural resource services, volunteer service for management, enhancement, conservation of natural areas. Uh, improve public understanding of natural resource ecology and management. We provide natural resources training at the local level and gather dedicated and informed volunteers to educate the community. And we are in the process of developing K-State Research and Extension Master Naturalist Volunteer Network. And that network is growing. So let's talk a little bit about the Master Naturalist program compared to Master Gardeners. First of all, I mentioned the first class was trained, it was in 2013. As of July this year, there are 139 active Extension Master Naturalists. The next training will be next spring, okay? So Extension Master Gardeners, for the most part, focus on home gardens, vegetables, garden tours, kind of with the human eye, the human aesthetic, the human need for wanting plants, trees, you know, house plants and that kind of thing. Um, master naturalists focus on ecosystems, natural areas, habitat, uh, clean water, air quality, and so on. I know that the Johnson County Master Gardeners have their own subgroups um, that had started before the Master Naturalist organization started, the people wanting to focus more on ecosystems. So I don't know, Wyandotte County, you may have subgroups like that of people that are focusing more on uh, planting for wildlife, planting for habitat. But anyway, the training program um, is all explained on the website. And again, that is in your resource links. So offered once a year, it's 40 hours of training over six or eight weeks, depending on how they lead it. And then to maintain your cert to, to first become certified and then maintain your certification, you have put in 30 volunteer hours and 
take 10 hours of advanced education each year. So it was similar to Johnson County Master Gardeners, and I would imagine it's similar to the Wyandotte County also. So some of our current projects, we work with most of the county parks in Johnson County and around the city. We work with Kansas City Wildlands to collect and sort native seed and for invasive species removal. We have bluebird stewards that manage and monitor bluebird houses throughout Johnson County. We maintain a healthy ecosystem at the north end of Shawnee Mission Park as potential habitat for the harmless red-bellied snake, which is the Kansas species in need of conservation. Um, so there's some fun programs. It's not just all about um, gardening or pollinators. Uh, we just started this year a group that's working on water quality and um, especially doing water quality testing with, with kids. There is a junior master naturalist program that's just started this year, a very first year for that, that's focused on, I think it's fifth to eighth graders. So anyway, some great stuff happening there. The master naturalist role at the pollinator prairie. So remember the, the, the prairie was uh, installed in 2012. We came in in 2017. So, we partner with Haley and Aldridge, they're still involved, to coordinate the public events. So they actually manage the event, the tents, the food, the signage, the toilets, some of the activities and partnerships. Master naturalists provide content in the multiple booths. We do guided garden tours and bring in other uh, nat native partners to present and have booths at our events. Um, we maintain the existing garden beds along with Haley and Aldrich. So if we have questions about the soil cap or the location of new plants or shrubs, especially because of their deeper and thicker roots, we are always cognizant that we contact Haley and Aldrich before we plant anything on the soil cap that hadn't already been planted there before. Um, we've in the process of creating a long-term site plan to include some additional garden areas with different natives. We're talking about a pawpaw patch uh, and more areas for walkways and benches and so on. We develop partnerships with organizations, some we've already listed, um, and maintain those current certifications as well as continuing to look for future certifications. We offer uh, a lot of garden tours, partnerships and work days. For example, the Olathe Public Schools and their Green Tech Academy. Um, came, we do a lot of speaking engagements about this. So this presentation that I'm giving is actually accessible to the master naturalists that, that anybody can give this presentation who's involved with the pollinator prairie. And currently we're almost finished with a comprehensive field guide that'll be published as a historical documentation of the site. So some of the enhancements that we've put in uh, we've created entryway, that entryway garden was brand new with host plant shrubs and uh, vines. We've got some pipe vine and uh, nine bark, I forget what all along the entryway fence. So it doesn't look like you're just coming into a grassy site that you don't know what's there. We added a covered pavilion and benches. And when I say we added, it was our idea. We went through Haley and Aldrich. They got approval from Boeing to fund it and the Superfund site actually paid for the installation of the covered pavilion and benches. Uh, we installed a new larger garden shed. Some of our master naturalists, um, significant others were very, very uh, generous in their volunteer time to help make that happen. We removed a lot of invasive honeysuckle, some winter creeper. If you remember the picture down at the south end, there were a lot of trees there that understory was all invasive species. And so that has been removed and the plan is in place now as to how it's gonna be uh, repaired. The trees are still there, um, but whether we'll overseed it, whether we're going to just continue to monitor the honeysuckle for a couple of years, uh, we're still discussing what we think will be the best way to restore a more woodland area down in that site. When we first came in, there were um, a few homeless people that were living down under those trees. There was a lot of trash and debris down there. So it's been an interesting place. And I know the neighborhood's happy to have that cleaned up. Uh, we put, there's two bluebird houses uh, that are monitored by the EMNs. I don't think anybody's nested yet, but it's gonna happen. Uh, we do burning rotation in the garden, in the grassy beds. Um, We've had some difficulties with the grass beds. One 
uh, was just totally overtaken by uh, ragweed and bindweed. The other is 90% bindweed. And then a third one uh, was actually taken over by the Illinois bundle flower, which is a native four. But um, so we're working on how we're going to manage these grassy areas so that people can get a sense of what would be a good seed mix, uh, how they could have something that looks like a remnant prairie or grassy prairie uh, in their own yard. So that's that's been one of those learning curves. Uh, we put in butterfly puddlers, two big bird baths filled with sand and small stones. And we have a water drip system. So there's a two tier. Uh, this is in the Monarch Garden where we have that, that keeps water in there all the time. Um, we also have a bird bath that um, is not listed here, and that's in the bird garden. We revised some of the planting beds, and that was with deep gratitude to Missouri Prairie Foundation. Some of the plants that I mentioned earlier were too, too tall to be growing right along the edge of the walkways inside the beds. We removed those and had grant funding to be able to put in some lower growing um, grasses and other forbs that would help, we're hoping, hold up some of the taller plants. So about the first 12 to 18 inches um, around the paths. We've done two of those gardens so far to see how well that does to be able to redesign the edging and help not just make it easier for people to walk through and, and feel more welcoming, but to reduce the maintenance time that we have to spend on keeping the paths clean. We have created, um, we've got a website and Facebook page. You can just look for Pollinator Prairie Dash Olathe, Kansas. And um, the website has all this history and the links to everything on it. We've done a ton of environment educational opportunities, seed gathering. If you want to do a work day in the fall, uh, connect with us and you get to take home seed too. So this is a site where people who come gather seed or who dig plants out of the middle of the pathway are welcome to take them home. So that's different than a native restoration site. So if you were to go to work at the Og Prairie uh, Native Restoration Site, for example, at Shawnee Mission Park, it is against the law for you to dig up plants or take seeds out of that site. You have to actually be uh, given authority by the park department to be able to remove seeds or plants. Um, when seeds are gathered on some of these other, whether they're an original native site or a restored site or a remnant site, those seeds are are used to um, enhance other restoration sites, okay? They're not sold to the public. They're not available even for volunteers to take home. But the pollinator prairie is a whole different ball of wax. And we really encourage people to come and take seeds and um, come do a work day and feel free to take home any plants that we dug up that we didn't, we didn't want them where we saw them. We have a site brochure that we've created here in the Speakers Bureau. And then future plans uh, to do pollinator inventories. We've, we're working on that. I, I think it's called iNaturalist, um, is a, an app that you can use to take a picture of pollinators and to be able to at least assess what's there. There was no assessment. We know there was nobody there uh, in 1989. There were no critters at all. Um, but we're just now starting to get the technology and the ability to really determine the benefit of what, what we see is growing. And I just want to share a little experience that I had. I, we had, while well, during these couple of months, while people were coming out in public together, you know, June and July of this year, uh, the Northeast Kansas Beekeepers Association wanted to have their first public gathering, you know, their organizational me meeting in public, in person, and they wanted to do it at the Pollinator Prairie. And so um, I was invited to come to coordinate that and to come do a presentation about the site and so on. The way they were seated, we were under the gazebo and there were a hundred people there. And so everybody's in their chairs, uh, kind of towards the west side of that gazebo. And I was standing on the east side of the gazebo facing them. The sun was setting and from where I was, I could see insects just flying, just buzzing and flying all over. It was, it was like the olden days. So I don't know how old any of you guys are, but I've seen a few years here. And I remember the days 
when every car trip that we took, we would have to stop not to get gas, but to clean the dead insects off our windshields, right? That's what it used to be like. We never clean insects off our windshields anymore. So to be able to see that in the sunset was just very rewarding. Here's some pictures of some of our past events. We have these great displays on, we have, we have about six or seven different topics of displays. I wanna point out this glorious woman here is Betsy Betros. Betsy was uh, in the inaugural group of Master Naturalists. She, Betsy is the, the expert on insects. She is the, the uh, published a book called The Butterflies of um, the Kansas City Region. She is, she's just an amazing woman. And uh, so we're really happy to have her with us. Um, this is the Prairie Burn. So you can see where this is. Here's the railroad tracks. Here's the wrought iron fence that I mentioned. And here's one of those grassy strips. And you can see these are not grasses. That's that Illinois bundle flower taken over. And um, it's really been interesting. We've, a couple of years, we burned two of the patches in the spring and two in the fall. Uh, they're supposed to be benefit. Um, I think in this in the fall burn benefits grasses and the spring burn benefits forbs, but I might have that backwards. Um, but we're trying to manage, do a little bit of research on uh, what difference it makes. Part of the reason we didn't wanna burn all of them is the impact to the wildlife, any critters that had nested in the ground or in the native stocks, um, that we wanted to be sure that we didn't uh, destroy all of them by burning all the prairies at once, all the prairie patches at once. Uh, garden tours, um, school groups, garden clubs. Uh, there's a just you can just contact Extension Master Naturalist Speaker Bureau and get more information about that. We have some fun kids activities. This is a tagging that we do at the Oscillago Monarchs. So Monarch Watches tagging program. Um, the unique numbers on these tags, it's a little fuzzy here, are entered on the Monarch Watch site that indicates the place and date of release. So anyone who finds a tag on a Monarch can go to the website, report its location, and see where it was originally released. So this helps with the statistical tracking of Monarch populations and overwintering sites. So I hope we'll be able to have this event September 25th outdoors. Visitors are encouraged to step into the gardens. These are some of the tabling displays that I mentioned. We have bringing nature home, chemical free gardening, pollinators and pollination, inviting birds to your yard, native versus honeybees, polluters to pollinators, okay, which is the history of the site. Um, so how's it funded? Well, the super fund manages all the expenses related to monitoring the water quality and general maintenance to the site, and that will continue to be the case. Donations to the K-State Extension Education Foundation can be earmarked for the pollinator prairie. We've had a lot of great donations that have helped us do some of the extra work and maintenance that we've wanted to do that was not related to the re remediation and was something we wanted to do. We didn't want to ask uh, Boeing to fund it. So things like, you know, building the tool shed and things like that. Um, we have gotten some grants. Missouri Prairie Foundation, the K-State Extension Education Foundation has granted us some funds and native plant sales. So uh, we have a couple growers who are master naturalists and uh, there's a, a native grower in Olathe, Parsons Gardens, who've had native plant sales, that a, por a portion of the proceeds have gone to help uh, fund our organization at the Pollinator Prairie. And then lots of in-kind donations, uh, people just donating stuff, uh, volunteer time especially on the materials, the website design, and we have corporate work days too, which has been really fun. So we hope you'll visit the gardens. They're open to the public seven days a week. Just note there are no toilet facilities. So you plan the, there's a quick trip right when you get off I-35 on Ridgeview. And, uh, and there's also a couple of fast food, food joints right there. Uh, Extension Master Naturalists, uh, I just realized I only have 2019 statistics, but um, there were 93 members at that point. So 139 now. And the impact that we have had on the community in our various areas 
has been astronomical just up until that point. This is for the one year uh, an estimated financial value of $145,000, right? We contact, we're in contact with the presentations for 8,700 people and accrued 6,500 volunteer hours. So um, I invite you to consider being coming part of the Extension Master Naturals program. You must be a resident of Kansas to apply. Uh, we have one question. What okay. is the limit to root depth of things that can be planted? Native uh, liatris, for example, can have roots 15 to 16 feet deep, which would be deeper than the cap level. Yeah, it's not the depth of the roots, it's kind of the thickness of the roots. And so those everything that I've seen over these years, um, any native wildflower and grasses can be planted on the soil cap without any problem. It's when we get into shrubs, small trees and large trees that the thickness of those roots could go down and damage the soil cap. So I hope that answers your question. But yeah, some of those roots can get pretty darn tall. Oh yeah, we'd love to have you get involved in community outreach, just even uh, take your own tours over there. You know, take people over, come out to some of our events. All right, we got one more section here that we're gonna go through. And some of this you may know, but this is the evolution of a gardener. And this was Lynn had mentioned that I'd written this article a few years back. It's been an interesting journey. This was the first garden I ever put in and it was daylilies, irises, viburnum. I think this was a little, um, uh, buck brush that was there that that is the native none of the rest of these are you know just some kind of in the corner these are my neighbor's compost bins at the time uh, this is about 30 years ago okay and my passion for gardening has just evolved originally I wanted welcoming vibrant colors and lush autumn hues in my yard and it was all about the attraction to my human eye right but planting for wildlife has a different aesthetic, a different look and feel. This article is available if you just go to the resilientactivist.org and put in evolution of a gardener, that'll come up for you. So it was originally in the Kansas City Gardener magazine. Um, but it's been an interesting journey and a lot of learning. So this was uh, a later garden that I had. In this garden, we've got butterfly milkweed, we've got... Um, Slender Mountain Mint, this is some common milkweed, Coreopsis, there's some Echinacea not blooming yet, some Rigid Goldenrod not blooming, this will be a glorious aster in the fall, uh, tall phlox, and uh, probably some other things in there. So why is a native garden important? Well, it's the whole cycle of life, the whole food chain. So if you like bird watching, for example, birds, even those that are seed eating as adults, they feed thousands of caterpillars to their fledglings. So one clutch of um, chickadees, so in other words, one, one nest full, four to six eggs of chickadee babies, will take 4,000 to 6,000 caterpillars in order for them to mature to fledging. That's a lot of caterpillars. So yeah, we want to see butterflies in our yard. We want to have a whole lot of monarchs and whatever swallowtails, you know, that we love to see. But beneath that are these thousands and thousands of, of caterpillars that need to also be in the garden so they can be eaten by the birds who are feeding their young. So the caterpillars have a lot more protein than seeds do, and that's why they do that. The adult pollinators need habitat for nesting and overwintering. The plants, which the plants provide, the plants need clean water, healthy soil, and pollinators so they can reproduce, right? If they're not pollinated, they don't produce their seeds, and so they can create more plants. The plants and trees give off life-giving oxygen, and they filter carbon from the air. Our mowed lawns provide habitat for very few living beings, especially when they're treated with insecticides and other chemicals. So when you start planning your garden, you want to assess your property to determine the best site. What was there before the neighborhood construction? There were probably trees, understory, maybe it was farmland, 
what was the water retention and habitat like before construction came in? So in this diagram, uh, this is Woodland Road and um, the, the property goes downhill off to the right there. When the neighborhood was developed, it was developed with leaving the native habitat around the outside edge, right? So in this scenario, the water flow in a rainstorm is all run off into these side creek beds is basically what they have. So all the storm drainage that's put in on the streets here would run off, there'll be, uh, you know, big pipes that send that water out into this area around the neighborhood. These creek beds include all the chemicals that are on those streets and rooftops, right? And any chemicals that are in the grasses. So you wanna pay attention to the flow of water, uh, where it goes, and in this particular case, behind this neighborhood is the Mill Creek Streamway, which runs directly into the Kansas River, the Missouri River, that follows that whole thing down, okay? So when you create a garden that'll keep the water on your property, it will seep out much more slowly into the groundwater and be those chemicals, many of them will be filtered out before it's run off, before it gets into the groundwater or gets into the creek beds and off into our waterways. Some of the important aspects of stormwater management is to slow the flow of water, prevent flooding. Noticing some of the root depth of the native plants helps prevent erosion and stabilizing stream banks. A lot of the issue down in the Gulf of Mexico is sediment um, coming from even all the way up into Iowa that, that's just erosion that's uh, changing all the habitats of the wetlands areas down in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, native gardens can minimize the impact of urban development by putting back some of that water retention and water management also minimizes the risk of flash flooding. So every year we know down in Southern Missouri, if you go down what used to be, um, well, it's 49 now, 71 highway, right down past Joplin, that was all flooded for, for months. That was our water going down there from our suburban developments and urban developments. So by keeping the water on our property, we can help um, minimize flooding. And the flooding comes from rooftops, driveways, patios, streets, our downspouts, and our fescue lawns. So this image shows the depth of the roots. These on, on the left side are um, common plants in our home. They're about two and a half, one and a half, maybe four feet and four inches deep. Whereas these native plants that could be used in the same places, you can see the depths of roots here. This is down to uh, 15 feet here. Some of them go even deeper. One of the benefits of reducing the size of your lawn can help you reduce watering with city water. That's the water you pay for. That's the water that our city has to keep clean and monitor, right? It can reduce expense for your mowing time. You quit, can quit using fertilizers and chemicals in that area because um, once you have an established native garden, there's no weeds that you really have to worry about, and you don't want to put chemicals on anyway because of the pollinators that you're bringing in. So according to Bridging the Gap, 59% of our water use is for the outdoors. So look how much money you can save by taking up more of your yard. Native gardens are adapted to our weather patterns, wet in the spring, dry and hot in the summer, and they can be used as a buffer to filter and slow down water before it gets to the nearest creek. So for example, here's a rain garden uh, holding some water in. They're actually built that way to maintain water at the site for a day or up to three days before it filters out. This is a buffer space. This is actually the same garden here. Uh, so that area around the neighborhood where the the, all the stormwater drains is right behind here. So in addition to that, coming downhill is more chemicals from the lawns, from the streets, going through the backyard there into this area. So this buffer space stops that flow of water, the water that didn't go into the stormwater systems, right? Just the water coming off of the yards, um, stops the flow of water and filters it out 
before it gets into the creek bed. So this is called a buffer area. If you don't have a yard, <laughs> just put your tall, get some tall pots and you want to be sure you get tall pots. This was only about an eight inch pot, it might have been 10, but this is one butterfly milkweed plant, a little tiny one. It came in a little, you know, three inch pot. Uh, it's two months old, you can see that tangle of roots. So um, if you're going to do pots, and then at some point, either put them in your garden or uh, give them to friends to share and get some fresh ones the next year. A really important thing to think about um, as you're deciding what plants you're going to put in your native garden is to uh, include trees. Um, you can see here that one native oak can 143 species of butterflies, moths, and skippers. Those are the insects that the birds are feeding to their babies. By the way, this tree is located in the Olathe Community Center parking lot. You drive around by the trash bins. It's over 90 feet from the branch on one side all the way across the other side. It's a glorious, glorious oak tree. Reduce your runoff and retain water with rain barrels. Um, one inch rain on a roof of a thousand square foot building is about 600 gallons of water. And when you add your driveway, patio, and so on, a one inch rain can produce over a thousand gallons of water. Uh, cut off the down, uh, really pliable, moldable, movable uh, connections you can put on. These two rain barrels are connected, uh, they're daisy chained together. So it flows into the first one, there's a hose connecting to the second. So you can actually have two together. And I just use them to water everything I can think of except the bird bath because you get a lot of algae in there. So bird baths, you wanna to continue to use clean water. So here we go. Here is your 10 step, no dig native garden. Okay, easy on your back, easy on your pocketbook. Step one, select a sunny location. This is where this is going here. Mow the lawn down the lowest setting. Cover it with layers of newspaper. You can use cardboard, you can use um, paper bags. Um, mound the garden one to three inches, so three feet rather. So you're making a, a little berm in the yard there, depending on how big you want it to be. Um, step four, lay out your plants. In this case, put the taller ones that are in the center. Uh, go ahead and plant them. Add shredded leaves um, or a thin cover of mulch. So um, for the most part in the first year, you are gonna wanna mulch it. But after that, you probably won't need to because the plants will spread out. So don't put a real thick layer of mulch, but put enough that to keep some moisture in. So this garden is mostly native plants with a few non-natives for long blooming ne nectar production, like this cat mint, for example. It's a little more formal because of its location in the front yard. We don't recommend the usual amount of wood mulch. We've talked about that already. Um, so there you have that much. Step seven, tuck under the outside. So wherever you had, there's still a little showing here, whatever you had sticking out the edge, tuck under those so you have a couple extra layers of folded newspaper or paper bag to make the edge of your garden and cover with either mulch or decorative border of some sort if you wanna use bricks or whatever you wanna do. Um, one of the best things in a, formal area is make it look very intentional. Give it a nice clean edge because it might look a little messy uh, as some of those plants develop. Definitely add some artwork, right? This is not a native gecko, but he's real happy in that garden. Uh, water it in well, keep it moist the first year, and then after that you just decide. You know, probably July and August in the second year you might want to water, and after that you won't need to if you if you put in all perennials. You want to clean up in March. Um, if you feel comfortable doing it, it's best to leave the dead stalk standing until next spring. Uh, there might be overwintering native bees in the dead stalks. So when you trim the dead stalks, leave 12 to 18 inches remaining throughout the summer. There's summer nesting insects that will lay their eggs in those stalks. So I'll have a. I'll show you in the next picture here. Um, some of the native bees, mason bees and leaf cutters, for example, make a hole along the stalk. So a lot of the stalks of these native plants, like this echinacea, if you look down at a dead stalk, would be hollow in the middle, or it might have that pithy uh, center, soft pithy center. 
Some of the native bees will make a hole along the stalk, deposit an egg along with a dollop of nectar and pollen, and then close up the hole with a chewed plant material or mud. And that egg will develop often over the winter, but sometimes during the summer to emerge in the spring. So here's just a cool picture. This is a leaf cutter bee carrying a little piece of leaf that it may have taken off of these baby red buds. So this is a typical shape of a red bud leaf, although someone's chewed a corner out of this side of it. And what they'll do is they'll come chew a circle. They'll take it with them somewhere to, a, this is the interior of one of those dead stalks. And what they'll do is they'll create a little burrito for her egg. So nectar and pollen, fold up the burrito and push it into the empty stalk. And so there's a number of them shoved in here and they'll overwinter and mature from that, from within that stock. So even a small garden will make a big difference. Notice the sign. It's really important to put a sign up to educate your neighbors, really important. Maintenance, now what? You wanna water weekly the first year, regularly the second year if it needs it. On the third year, you don't need to. Now, most of the perennials, according to the season of bloom, will begin to die back. Don't deadhead them, that's bird seed, right? If you wanna clip some seeds to give to other people or to plant somewhere, don't take more than one third of the seed heads that are there. So it's really fun to see chickadees and goldfinches in the winter standing on the top of these dead stalks eating the bird seed. Plus it saves you on the cost of bird seed. You can mow or use the weed eater the first year if you want. It depends on if you're putting in a really clean area, clean soil, you won't have weeds coming up. Um, if you're going to put it in an area, a broader area that's not um, where you haven't brought in fresh soil, you might want to keep it mowed or use a weed eater the first year or two. Um, it doesn't hurt the plants or they're perennials. Uh, you just won't get much bloom that first year. After that, uh, you only have to clean up about once a year, usually in late March. Uh, large areas, you might want to rake or clean up after the mowing if there's a lot of debris there. Um, you can fence or stake it as you want. You know, make it look nice. Put in tomato cages are nice for some of the ones that grow in a kind of a broader circle, like some of the liatris, for example, um, before they start to flop over. Make it look, it's your garden, right? Make it look uh, as aesthetically pleasing as you want. Big area, you might want to consider burning or removing trees that come up. So right now we're doing a restoration in our backyard and there's a lot of weed trees back there. I can't burn because the electrical lines go right, you know, from the pole to the house uh, and the neighbors probably wouldn't be too happy with it. So depending on your property, obviously you need to check with the fire department and see what the requirements are. If you're put planting into fresh area, fresh soil, you probably don't ever have to need to, I mean, you don't have to ever burn. Focus on host plants for caterpillars. Some of you may know Lenore Larson, she's the butterfly lady. Some of these that are listed are not native, uh, snapdragon, angelonia, uh, the mustards, parsley, dill, fennel, but they're great host plants, right? So there's no reason why you can't do both. If that's, if you grow vegetables and herbs anyway, you might just consider growing extras for some of the other plants. There's an art for some of the critters. Uh, there's an article on the Resilient Activist site. This is not in the resources link. Um, that's tomato hornworms, point them some love or something like that. And it's this concept of creating a sacrificial garden for tomato hornworms and tobacco hornworms. Because when those critters mature, they actually become uh, this glorious sphinx moth, the hummingbird moth, the beautiful. So if you have a space, if you grow tomatoes and you want tomatoes to come on your plants, you don't want the tomato hornworms there, create a place somewhere else in your garden, in the backyard, somewhere back corner, where you've got other tomato plants growing and just take those babies off of there and put them over there. If you don't want to touch them, you know, uh, contact a kid they'll be happy to pick them off. They're pretty sturdy or cut that one stem off and take the stem over. So there's a different way to think about your gardening as you, as you plant your gardens, plant for wildlife. Plant for all seasons, early, 
midsummer, late, and over the winter, winter especially, habitat, seeds, and ground cover. And plan for multiple reasons, mating, nesting, brood rearing, protection, and migration. Migration is especially important when it comes to something called pollinator pathways. That's where you invite your neighbors to also put in a garden. So a butterfly can go from one house to the next to the next with everything they need. Install signs, all these different sites have signs that um, if you qualify, you can have signs to put up in your yard. Some charge for it, some you can just download and print and laminate yourself. Um, how can you fund it? There are some, um, Johnson County has a lot of funds available. I have yet to find anything for Wyandotte County, I'm afraid. Um, but what I suggest you do is connect with your uh, public works department, stormwater management, and see if they have funding available for, um, for homeowners to put in native gardens. So what's the most important item in your native garden? You create an area in your garden where you feel safe and comfortable and make the time to go there. Take a nap, read, clear your mind and let go of tension. Three deep breaths in nature will replenish your heart and uplift your mood. And hundreds of studies have shown all these benefits and more. And that information is on the resources handout. We are, I just want to talk about when someone's chewing on the leaves of your plants, you do the happy dance. You welcome everybody who wants to come eat on them. And you may have other critters come in. We've got, uh, these were just ones that showed up in my yard, a milk snake, American bullfrog. Some of the things you can do. And we have some upcoming events. So um, next week, um, bring deep nature or the 17th to outdoor interpretation of planet native landscapes and Hasta Luego monarchs are coming up. And we're up to number three, and I think we're about done here. Well, I'll get these questions out quickly. I see you have common we'll in your native garden. Example, how do you deal with its aggressive spreading I had three and now I have 13. <laughs> well, first of all, feel free to take those seed pods off and donate them to somebody else, right? Granted, there are the milkweed bugs that like to eat those seed pods, which is part of what they do to help prevent that spread. Um, other than that, I will be really frank. Some people uh, just get tired of them and they remove them from their yards. So the other thing to do is they don't really transplant very well because of the deep roots. But if you're looking, you want to have them because they're easy to grow, put them in the way back in a place where you don't really mind having them. The other is a comment. Uh, bees, wasps don't make a hole in the stalk. They enter from the broken or cut top, will excavate the pithy center if not hollow then create several chambers and seal off the end. They can't get in to uncut, unbroken stems. I know that's true for many of them. Um, I wish I knew the name of the one that, um, we've had some examples at the Pollinator Prairie where there's a little teeny tiny hole uh, going up the stems on the outside. So I don't have the answer to what, if, if anyone ever identified who that was, that put that in there, but um, it's a good point. And uh, interestingly, the uh, when they when a bee lays their eggs like that, they will lay the female eggs first, so down lower in the stalk, and the male eggs towards the top. Uh, they actually determine the sex of the egg at the time that the egg is deposited. So it's very interesting. Someone with partial shade, go to grownative.org and missouriwildflowers.net and look for shade garden and shade plants. Okay. They've got some great selections. Good. I'm glad you caught that last question. Yeah. I am going to need to say thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, All right. Let me, let me just show the, the resources page right here. Okay. That's got that website where all the resources are.